Thank you very much, Brock. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for connecting today. So um, as Brock mentioned, um, I'm currently Director of Research at Bravita, which is a Venezuelan environmental NGO. Uh, but also for the last six years, I've been a member of the um, Red List of Ecosystems thematic group. And uh, for the last couple of years, for its, uh, I'm also a member of its uh, steering committee. So uh, it's very exciting to be able to have this platform to share with you some of the knowledge of, and on the Red List of Ecosystems. Since uh, this is a varied um, audience, I'm sure, uh, the, I'm going to start to, for today's presentation with uh, a general introduction on what the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems actually is for, you, of the, for those of you who might not be um, as aware of this protocol uh, as of now. Um, but then I, um, I'm going to present on some of the levels of actions of the Red List of Ecosystems, which I'm going to refer to as the RLE from now on, just for time's sake. Um, and then the main focus of the, of the presentation is on why uh, do we undertake an RLE assessment? So what are the main applications of these, uh, these protocol? And then I just want to end up with uh, sharing with you some of the resources and tools that are already available for completing um, RLE assessments, but also give you some updates, some exciting updates of the new products that we've been working on and that will become available very soon. And um, you know, we'll finalize with uh, your questions. So with, without further ado, what is the Red List of Ecosystems? So it is a global standard for assessing the risk of collapse of the world ecosystems, which was officially adopted by uh, the IUCN's Council in May of 2014. So we are a fairly <laughs> new um, initiative, only six years old, officially. Um, and uh, the, the, the RLE provides a global framework for monitoring the states of the world's ecosystems which can be applied to internally cons consistent classifications of ecosystems. Um, it was purposely designed to be robust, so grounded in ecological theory and evidence-based quantitative criteria, uh, but also generic enough to be applicable for terrestrial, marine, freshwater, and subterranean, subterranean systems, as well as to consider diverse mechanisms of ecosystem change. And uh, finally, um, it, um, it was designed uh, in a way to allow for its results to be comparable. So the main goal of the RLE, is, uh, which is a part of this growing tool, uh, toolkit of IUCNs to assess biodiversity loss risks, um, it is to uh, support conservation in resource use and management decisions by ranking different ecosystem types according to their risk of collapse in a very, uh, in a parallel way as to what the red list of threatened species does. So the heart of the early protocol is uh, this risk assessment model, which you're um, now seeing on your screens. As you can see in the center, it includes five, rule-based um, criteria for assessing uh, risks to ecosystems, the named from A to E. Four of these criteria are focused on four ecological symptoms to estimate the risk of an ecosystem losing its defining characteristics. So it's uh, defining a characteristic native biota, and uh, or its uh, key ecological processes. This, um, of these four, two of them are focused on our spatial symptoms or distribution symptoms, which are the ones that are represented on the left in green, criterion A and B. Criterion A um, looks at uh, the, the risks associated to a declining distribution which might indicate uh, you know, the continuous incidence of uh, threatening processes that result in ecosystem loss. Uh, criterion B is um, 
it is focused on risks linked to uh, an ecosystem having a restricted distribution, uh, which you know might predis predispose it to spatially explicit threats. Um, then on the right, in blue, we have the two, two other criteria which are uh, linked to functional symptoms of uh, symptoms of collapse. So on the top, uh, criterion C is looking at the degradation of the abiotic environment, uh, which you know might result in reduce might result in uh, reductions to habitat quality or diversity of the abiotic niche. Or com the component biota, um, in, for example, ocean acidification or loss of soil fertility, etc. Um, similarly, uh, criterion D is also looking at the interruption of uh, the, the key ecological processes, but from the biotic point of view. So it looks at the disruption of the biotic processes and interactions which can result in the loss of you know, mutualisms, the diversity of the biotic niche of the, uh, of the component biota, um, changes in the trophic, uh, in the trophic stru uh, um, hierarchy structure um, of the system, et cetera. And then uh, the interaction between two or more of these four mechanisms can produce uh, of course, additional symptoms of transition to ecosystem collapse, uh, which, you know, and these multiple mechanisms and their interactions can be integrated into an ecosystem dynamics simulation model uh, to produce quantitative estimates of the risk of collapse. So that's uh, what criterion E, uh, the quantitative risk analysis criterion looks at, uh, that the one at the, at the bottom. And this is, um, I want to point out that this criterion is the one that sets the, the basis for the rest of the, of the risk assessment model because it is what allows us to uh, clearly define what uh, each of the threat categories means. Um, so what it means in terms of, you know, when we would lose and we expect to lose an ecosystem that is uh, critically endangered versus when we, we expect to lose an ecosystem that is uh, endangered. And for, uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with the red list of uh, threatened species, I hope that you know, you'll notice the, all the parallels that exist between uh, these uh, criteria and the ones for species. And this was, you know, it was not random, it was uh, purposely done so, so that they could be not only, you know, just to build from what species has already done, but also uh, for, um, these, uh, these protocols to be complementary to each other. So I don't have the time to go into detail for um, what each of these um, criteria do and, and you know, the type of data that is needed to assess them. Um, I'll be providing some, of, some links to resources where you can definitely look it up and learn more about it. Um, but just in general, know that um, each for, you know, when we conduct an early assessment, um, we expect that all of the that assessment to encompass all of the, these five criteria, so to assess all of the five whenever data are available. And the general risk status of the ecosystem type um, is assigned to the highest risk category obtained through any of these criteria. Uh, so we follow the precautionary principle when assigning the final overall uh, risk category. And then um, each of these criterion, the criteria has a set of sub-criteria and thresholds and you know, quantitative measures uh, that uh, look into different uh, measures of decline or degradation and different timing windows or distribution metrics. Um, so you know, it's, it's definitely a rule-based uh, uh, system. Um, so just in general, then, so we have, you know, we would have the, the four um, criterion, criteria with their uh, sub-criteria, which as, as I mentioned, each of them are linked to specific uh, uh, thresholds. And uh, what we uh, can accomplish with this is uh, depending on the, you know, the, the results, the characteristics of the, of the indicators that we are using for or 
Earth ecosystem and the, the changes that it's experiencing at these, these uh, spatial and functional systems, um, the, the ecosystem unit would be assigned to one of these eight different uh, categories, which are, again, similar to the ones used for species. Um, and these are ordinal risk categories, rather, uh, so rather than uh, specific, you know, uh, categories that tells us some specific exact probability of, of collapse, uh, they are in, you know, they are, uh, they're comparable in the sense that we know that something, an ecosystem that is critically endangered is uh, more severely uh, threatened than one that is vulnerable in this case. Um, so the, um, there's eight categories that goes from uh, the, the highest risk at the top, which is a collapsed, collapsed ecosystem, um, going down to critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, almost threatened, least concerned, uh, data deficient, and not evaluated. So um, I should stop a minute and mention that uh, for, you know, collapse um, is the, the the, the end of the of the degradation process, if you may, uh, from the uh, red list of ecosystems point of view, it's um, equivalent to species uh, extinction. And we uh, there's you know there's a whole explanation of what you know the definition of of what collapse collapses. But for ecosystems, uh, basically just in general, we refer uh, to collapse once a collapse, collapse systems once it's gone beyond a threshold where it's lost its identity, uh, you know, beyond, beyond uh, the natural variability. So uh, it's gone over that threshold and uh, it's turned into something else, a novel ecosystem. And if that means, of course, that when we are conducting an assessment, we have to very clearly state what those uh, characteristics, basic characteristics of our ecosystem are, and uh, that those thresholds of collapse. And that's all defined by the experts, by the people that know these systems. But it's a critical part of the assessment protocol, as we'll see in just a minute. Um, so, sorry, I'm struggling with it. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to point out that out of these um, eight categories, just, just these three are um, actually indicative of threatened ecosystems, uh, critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. Uh, these are defined by these quantitative and qualitative criteria and sub-criteria and the thresholds. Uh, all of the categories are, or these categories are nested, so that a type of ecosystem that meets a criterion for critically endangered will also meet the criteria for endangered and vulnerable. And then the uh, these bottom um, two categories, data deficient and not evaluated, uh, are the two categories that are not indicative of any level of risk. We use data deficient to refer to those um, ecosystems that we tried to assess, we tried to, you know, we made an attempt to describe them, to find that the, the, the appropriate indicators, the, the data, uh, but there was not enough to uh, comply with the protocol, so we assigned this category. And um, in, you know, in, in, in contrast, not evaluated is just the category that we use for all of the ecosystems that have not been even, we haven't even tried to assess them, so by default, all of the world's ecosystems um, are assigned to not evaluated until we made that first effort. Um, so just, just to end this first introductory session, I just wanted to show you in very general, uh, in a very general uh, sense, what the assessment product uh, uh, what the risk assessment protocol for the RLE looks like. So the first step will always be to uh, define what we are assessing. So uh, which ecosystem um, units are we assessing? Which area of the world are we covering? Is it a, you know, a national assessment? Is it a global assessment? Is it a subnational assessment? Are we looking into just the mangrove 
of a certain uh, state? Are we looking at mangroves nationally? Are we looking at mangroves globally? And of course, um, the, um, just, let me just check real quick. Brock, I just wanted to check, are you being able to hear me well? I'm not tracking the, the chat. Oh yeah, you are just sound great. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, so the other thing, of course, is who is doing the assessment? What's the, the working group? Um, and you know, is it, is it a research team uh, at a university? Is it a, a mix of uh, researchers uh, from um, NGOs or and government and whatnot? Um, and this all depends on what the purpose of the assessment is. What we have that once we have that clear, the next step, um, and uh, I and I'm presenting this in a very uh, straightforward uh, order, I guess. Uh, it's not always this organized, and that's fine. Uh, but in 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 an ideal world, um, we define the units, we define the working group, and then we work on uh, defining the which ecosystem typology we are unit we are using. So how are we defining those ecosystems? Um, given the lack of a um, universally accepted ecosystem typology, but more on that later. Um, so what system, what classification system are we using? What, uh, what are those units, how we define them? And um, then we proceed, we have to actually characterize those uh, units. And for the uh, RLE protocol, there's four main characteristics that we need to address when defining an ecosystem. So that's uh, the characteristic, characteristic native biota, so the species that are part of that, of that system, the uh, interactions, the key interactions that happen with, between them and with their environment, the um, characteristic um, environment, so the, the abiotic characteristics, and uh, the distribution. So what's, what's the geographic area that the system uh, or those units uh, occupy, okay? Um, and then uh, that information needs, we need to be able to uh, map it. We, it needs to be spatially explicit. Uh, as you saw, a couple of the criteria are looking into spatial symptoms of change. So we definitely need to be able to uh, represent them uh, spatially uh, through, and how they, that might have changed through time. Um, that, that's followed by the construction of a conceptual model uh, which is a diagram that shows those key components and key interactions. And, um, you know, it's, it's the basis for identifying uh, which are the key indicators that we should be assessing for that ecosystem unit. What and identifying what we need, we should be measuring or how we should be defining or um, the uh, collapse thresholds for those, uh, for those units. So it summarizes our understanding of how these uh, ecosystem work and uh, the, the, key, um, the key indicators that we might use to assess them. Um, and based on that, that's why, that's why the, the next step is defining the, the class, collapse thresholds and the collapse states and uh, identify the key degradation indicators. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process of just identifying the ideal indicators and then uh, verifying if we have the data to throw as, assess those. Uh, there's all, not always we, we would have the uh, ideal data available. So uh, we might need to choose uh, the second ideal indicator. Um, then we follow that with, you know, through just gathering the data, the available data, making sure that we can address, we can assess each of the criterion and then go just go through the actual protocol of, you know, Contrasting the change data with the thresholds and the, the, the each of the sub criteria and assign the the, the risk uh, categories and all this whole process needs to be well documented assumptions need need, need to be made explicit uh, the quality of the data needs to be addressed so it's key to really work on um, for a, you know for a robust assessment um, that it's useful uh, as we want them to be. Uh, we need to make sure that we are covering all of those, uh, you know, assumptions and, 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 and uncertainties um, in the documentation uh, part of the process. There's some keys, uh, we provide some uh, 
suggestions and guidelines on how to do that. So uh, again, this, this, I can't go in detail over that uh, today, but there's a lot of resources that are available through the IUCN RLE website, uh, iucnrle.org. Uh, there's the main document that you can look at is the guidelines for the application of the Red List Ecosystems Categories and Criteria version 1.1. And then uh, that would have the step-by-step -step details of how to uh, conduct an assessment. So with that general introduction, I just wanted to uh, oh, go over briefly of at what levels does the RLE work? So the protocol um, was designed to be uh, applied to internally consistent classifications of ecosystem types at different geographic scales. Um, and it has, um, it has the flexibility to assess risks to ecosystems that vary greatly in biological environment and environmental characteristics. Um, again, at different uh, geographic scales of, and, and scales of organization and different amounts of available data. So um, we uh, there's you know at, at this point there's it's been proven that the the protocol can be applied under um, um, data rich situations which are of course ideal but uh, there's also examples of cases where we've been able to conduct assessments in when data is uh, relatively poor and still um, you know and, and still uh, obtain valuable uh, results. Um, one of them is just identifying key knowledge gaps that we should be addressing. So the assessments might, you know, they, they, they are characterized by the, the, the geographic scale or the scope that, uh, of the assessment, but also by uh, how many units we are assessing at any given time. So we have, in this sense, we have, we recognize two different types of assessments, strategic assessments. Uh, first are the ones that are looking into just one uh, related, uh, you know, one ecosystem at a time um, that, you know, that it's of interest for, you know, it might be a, a, a critical um, ecosystem, a very cult a culturally important ecosystem. Uh, uh, it, pro it could provide, you know, a valuable, valuable um, um, ecosystem services. So we're just looking at one unit at a time. And um, it, it's, these type of assessments are uh, usually applied for, you know, to inform strategic ecosystem management uh, because we're interested in conducting high resolution monitoring over time. Um, and it helps us, uh, it also, um, RLE in those cases helps us identify how an ecosystem uh, might be responding to alt alternative management strategies. So, um, you know, that's, there's a bunch of cases that have been completed and we'll see it uh, in a minute. And then the alternative, the other type of, ecosystem, of assessments is our um, systematic assessments, which, uh, which is when we, uh, add, you know, in one effort, we assess more than one unit or ecosystem unit. And that might be because they are, you know, within a certain area of interest. So uh, a certain re all of the ecosystems within a certain region or country or a subnational jurisdiction. Um, or it might be a thematic assessment. So looking at all of the mangroves or all of the forests uh, of a certain region at any given time. Um, and these type of assessments usually are more, are um, point towards uh, informing protected area designations or uh, establishing priorities for ecosystem management and investments and establishing priorities for restoration. So just broadly, uh, some of the, the just showing you some of the progress that the early has had in these past few six years or so uh, in terms of each of these types of assessments. Uh, this map shows uh, most of the uh, strategic assessments that have been conducted so far. As you can see, they are distributed across the world with um, a large hub of assessments in Australia, just because there's that's where um, a good part of the early um, leading uh, theme, thematic group members are located, are based, and they've been really good at pushing forward these, uh, the, 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 the trials or the, the, yeah, just the, those first case studies where we were trying out the methodology and, and, and how it works, it was, it was working. Um, 
there is over 35 strategic assessments that have been completed so far uh, across the world, covering both, you know, mostly, uh, um, a lot of them are terrestrial ecosystems, but there's also examples from freshwater and marine ecosystems. Um, and, and new assessments keep adding uh, to this list each day. Some of them are led by uh, CEM members, but many of them, uh, or inc increasingly more of them, are being led by uh, researchers from around the world who are just taking the, applying the methodology that is, you know, already public and applying the, applying it to their ecosystem. So the, in terms of the systematic assessments, um, this map shows, uh, it's the, you know, the colored uh, regions and the, and the crust Crush hatched uh, regions are uh, indicative of, of where systematic assessments have been completed or are underway, uh, or there's interest. Um, so this this map changes a lot. It's, it's hard to keep it updated, just because except for the ones that have been completed, just because there's still, there's there's definitely growing interest in applying the RLE for informing uh, management and and um, at spe especially at the national uh, level. So uh, we often get contacted by, um, you know, countries and or, or regions that are that would like to apply the RLE protocol to inform their decision decision making, um, and you know that's why this this map keeps growing uh, way beyond what we are we from the thematic group are doing directly. So there's uh, about over twenty countries. I have had national assessments underway or completed so far on all six on six continents. Um, actually, three countries have are already updating their their assessments, uh, so they are on the second version or even third version of their assessments. Um, and five of them are already already integrating. At least five of them are already integrating early into regulatory uh, policies, which is what I some of what I want to focus really uh, over the next few minutes. So why? What's the importance? Why do we conduct early assessments? Um, it's not just to know which certain ecosystems are risk and which are the ecosystems that are uh, doing well. Uh, we, uh, we think, we propose that RLE is an important tool to inform decision making and actions uh, through, you know, because it, it allows us to obtain a standardized measurements of ecosystem risk um, it allows us to overcome political and administrative limits by taking into account the entire system and its connectivity uh, and not just, you know, divided units. Um, it helps us monitor and assess the success of on-the-ground conservation measures uh, by, you know, conducting repeated uh, assessments. We can see how these, uh, these uh, measures are working or not. Um, it also allows us to identify key areas for restoration and design effective restoration measures. And um, it allows us to project how the landscape will change under uh, different climate and development scenarios, but also just project what uh, the changes to the ecosystems will be if we, we keep things as, you know, as usual, if we keep doing whatever we are we've been doing or um, how it might change if we change, you know, management. Um, and beyond that, you know, it, the RLE assessments uh, and the protocol allows us, allow us to understand the causes and symptoms of ecosystem change for e each of the units that we are assessing. Um, and uh, these, these assessments allow us to organize the available evidence um, it helps us identify indicators of change for risk assessment and monitoring um, that, you know, we might, uh, it might, it's important to keep gathering data on those in the future, or if we have, we don't have information on those, just um, those would be information gaps and uh, data collection needs that we should be addressing. Um, and um, it's, it's, you know, understanding these causes, which the RLD allows us to do, uh, it's a definitely a fundamental requirement for developing ecosystem management and restoration strategies. So, uh, definitely useful. Um, and, you know, looking at, a, at the broader picture, just some of the applications that we might be looking at uh, for, for RLD assessments, we expect them to inform national and international uh, target goals, such as the AISHI, the SDGs, uh, the Bond Challenge, uh, et cetera. 
Um, it, as I mentioned, that it should inform strategies for adaptive management, development planning, uh, national legislation, and so forth. And um, next, I'm, I'm going to go into a couple of those in more detail, just showing you some, mentioning some examples of how this has been, um, this is being done uh, as, you know, right now in several countries. Most of this information is summarized in a recent paper called Impacts of the IUCN Red List Systems on Conservation Policy and Practice uh, from Bland et al. Um, 2019, uh, and there's the link. If any of you are interested in going into more detail, you can check, check the, the, the paper out, and there's all the references for the case studies that I'll mention. So let's start with um, applications for protected area planning. Um, of course, systematic and national assessments, both you know, for terrestrial, marine, and freshwater um, ecosystems, would allow us to compare the status, the conservation status of different ecosystems within a certain region, a certain country, and we would they they would they would allow us to uh, not only you know identify which ones are more um, at, at risk and where they are spatially located, and we can. Um, combine that information with information on available already existing protected areas um, to identify which of the ecosystems are, uh, or especially the, the threatened ecosystems, are underrepresented within the, conserva the conservation areas. And then uh, help us prioritize, identify priority areas for new, uh, for new uh, conservation areas, uh, which might, you know, it might be private, it might be uh, public ones, and uh, think about how if, uh, if those areas are fulfilling their roles, their conservation roles, and if inform any changes to management plans that might be required. So um, is, there's a couple of attempts that have been done in this sense. Uh, an example uh, is from uh, Colombia, where um, you know, the, the, the early has really taken, a, a, it's really being used uh, for informing different aspects of management of decision making and conservation decision making, um, including informing new um, protected areas at the national level. Um, it's also being used in South Africa um, in, in, in different ways, not necessarily to define um, new uh, national um, protected areas, but, but also uh, just they've moved into um, uh, policies which Determine that critically and, uh, and critically endangered and endangered ecosystems resulting for, from the ecosystem risk assessments are uh, with are by default assigned to as critical biodiversity areas, and that um, triggers you know the needs for um, legal or triggers legal instruments uh, that for any land use planning within that affect those areas and any management decisions that uh, might affect those uh, critical, critical biodiversity areas. So South Africa is another country where uh, there's a really, there are some really good examples of how the RLE is being put into practice, into uh, applications. Then um, second, very relevant to this group, um, then there's of course the applications for restoration planning. So a couple of examples, uh, in Chile, um, the RLE was, uh, identified as, uh, as a key tool to prioritize restoration areas after the fires of 2017, uh, particularly um, within uh, private lands. In Australia, um, the assessment of the coastal swamps in the highlands um, that uh, you know, were uh, understanding the, the threats to the, that ecosystem revealed the need for uh, restoration after mining activity. So the, these, the assessment triggered um, you know, uh, uh, links to the mining industry and how they, could, they needed to do the restoration um, associated to their uh, activities. And then finally, also again in Colombia, um, there's been a lot of work into looking at uh, restoration of critically, and critically endangered and endangered ecosystems in remote areas with unproductive livestock grazing. And that's the map that I'm, I'm showing there. It's related to that case study. And I'm not going to go into detail over it, if despite the relevance for this group, um, just because there is going to be a separate seminar just focusing on this case study. 
Um, the paper came out very recently, a couple of months ago, and um, the, you have the link there if you want to check it out uh, beforehand. But uh, there'll be another seminar uh, just looking at this case study, and it's really interesting. Uh, it's, it's really interesting how, what they did on just using the RLE as one of the information layers of, uh, for defining these uh, restoration areas within grazing, you know, agri agricultural uh, low productivity areas um, that you might give concrete suggestions of where to do, where to concentrate these efforts and why the, what, where it might be more cost effective, but also just to have the highest um, benefits or produce the highest benefits. Um, thirdly, um, I just wanted to mention that the RLE can inform industry decision making in the sense that, you know, uh, once we have identified the ecosystems that are at greater risk, um, the, um, it, it might create the need for uh, these industry to report environmental impact assessments whenever they are, you know, in close proximity to these ecosystems um, and help inform uh, these uh, industries to reduce uh, to, or to, to help reduce investment risk for industrial clients. So, you know, particularly mining and, and, and timber, the timber industry. So there's examples of how it's been used in Colombia. Uh, it was incorporated into this uh, decision support tool called Tremarctus. Um, and the information is available, it's, you know, on the, the, the threatened ecosystems, it's available for everyone. And industry can check, you know, uh, how their, their new developments might affect uh, threatened ecosystems. And, uh, you know, might, if the, the decisions of, you know, changing the, the location might be, might be an option or how they would have to then invest on these, uh, on restoration efforts or whatnot. Um, there's also examples from Australia and South Africa related to uh, how the timber industry has been um, involved with uh, restoration uh, or, or with uh, reducing risks within um, key forest ecosystems and what they need, might need to do to uh, reduce the impacts that they're having on, on these uh, highly threatened ecosystems. Um, there's also examples or applications for uh, government regulation. So multiple jurisdictions have included the RLE within their legislation and government uh, regulatory instruments. In Australia, for example, the RLE criteria have been adopted as the common assessment, assessment method to unite historic, historically disparate listings uh, methods across multiple jurisdictions. So uni unifying uh, the method is, is really useful. And um, several countries, including um, Norway, for example, have, have um, adopted the RLE criteria or in the, or in, are in the process of doing so uh, for regulatory uh, uh, measures. So in some cases, for example, the results of the assessments for uh, threatened ecosystems might trigger uh, regulatory um, actions for uh, special land management or, or, resor or resource use prescriptions. And um, they, uh, so, legal, so threatened ecosystems can, be, be, can be, uh, immediately uh, can become uh, legally protected um, uh, in, these, in these regions. Sorry, I'm back. Um, I'm, just, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but this is a, there is an example from uh, the coastal uplands of uh, swamps of Australia, um, where you know, uh, the results of, the, of, these, uh, of the assessment, as, which was highlighted as endangered, due especially to water management um, and, and, and and the changes to, to how the water was being used and extracted. Um, sorry, this is, sorry, I'm just mixing my examples. So in the, this, uh, these swamps are key for uh, protecting an area that, it, where, uh, that supplies water you know, to uh, a large part of the Sydney population. And then uh, it was being affected by coal and natural gas extraction, gas extraction activities. Um, so there uh, were regulatory measurement measures put in place once uh, the ecosystem was categorized as endangered to reduce that impact. The RLE, of course, can inform also just, just create public awareness. 
on uh, the status of the of the world's ecosystems and uh, what we you know how we might need to change the way we are managing them to uh, generate community engagement um, uh, to ensure that these ecosystems with will persist um, in the future. Um, and then finally, just for time's sake, um, we can also think or see examples on how uh, the RLE is, is informing, uh, it's being used to, or it's going to be used to report uh, the meeting of international targets. And in South Africa is a good example. Uh, there, the information on threatened ecosystems um, is being is used as a headline indicator um, in a number of national reporting frameworks, including the National Biodiversity Assessment and the South African Environmental Outlook. So they've been working prior to the uh, official IUCN protocol. They already had a, a, a risk assessment protocol in place. They've been working on this for over 10 years. And there, it's a great example of how they um, these uh, type of risk assessments can be put into practice in policy um, and um, and management. Uh, another good example is Norway, uh, we, who this country has also been using the inputs for their uh, national biodiversity st strategies and uh, action plans, and um, they have been adopted as a basic input for national mapping program on important ecosystem types. And there's, uh, it's one of the countries that is actually working on a reassessment or has completed a reassessment. So the, um, I, I'm, this, this, was, this was meant as a general introduction, introductory presentation, but I just wanted to give you two specific um, resources that for those of you who are interested in learning more about how this is being done, I highly recommend this paper from the South Africa case study that just came out, um, more than just a red list. Um, they, this paper pro it provides a really in de detailed example of what, how, the, how this has, these risk assessments have informed policy in South Africa and how it's grown through time, how it's been a, you know, it's a process. It doesn't work from the very first day. It's, it, it needs um, management, it needs uh, adaptations. Um, but these authors um, provide a really good summary of the lessons learned and the recommendations from the integration of threatened ecosystems into their South African policy and legisla legislation that might inform what uh, you know, we might want to do in other countries. So that's, uh, it's a very detailed list of recommendations that goes from the very general to the very specific. So I highly recommend checking that out. And then there's a second paper that I recommend which from Alanis um, et al. Uh, from last year, um, which, you know, they propose these, uh, they, they look into the different, that these 20 policy instru instruments that could re help reduce the risks for threatened ecosystems. And, you know, they look into both into economic regulation, informative and preventive in instruments and how they might link to each of the RLE criteria and actually provide a framework for how we might uh, make those linkages with between assessments and uh, the, the policy, policy making and, and decision making. So putting, putting it into practice. And I just want to end uh, with giving you a brief overview of the resources and tools that are available. Uh, that some of them have been available for quite a few years now. Uh, the main one, one of the main ones is the guidelines that I already mentioned. It's the key document, the step-by-step -step guide to conducting an assessment, an early assessment. There's a bunch of training materials, guide exercises, tutorials that um, are really available and that we also just provide by, you know, organizing training workshops every now and then whenever there's funding and interest. Um, I include the red of ecosystems thematic group team as a resource because there's it's a getting larger <laughs> community of experts from around the world that have experience with um, the protocol and that are uh, most and uh, always willing to help out and uh, you know with the technical aspects with thinking through the the, the projects and uh, just providing support for the good um, the adequate um, application of the of the protocol 
there's the case studies um, that are have already been published and are great are a great guide to uh, for for people that are interested in conducting assessments, just seeing how it, they were implemented by other people in other regions in other ecosystems. It's just always useful. There's different software um, that are available, um, and all of these is uh, you know you can look at it through the at the website at, at the RLE website. Just highlighting uh, one of these software uh, programs that are available. It's the Remap tool. Um, it's not it's not only designed for you know early assessments. It's it's just it's a mapping online. It's an online mapping tool based on the Google Earth, Earth Engine platform, uh, and it's characterized by you know it's directed towards people that might not be GIS and remote sensing experts, but that require maps for conducting. Uh, their assessments. So it's a very uh, straightforward uh, tool for um, just producing a, a first version of those uh, ecosystem maps. And it has a lot of tutorials available that you can look at and uh, just for those of you that might be interested. And there's of course, of course, the website that has all of these resources, including the detailed uh, assessments that have been completed so far. But in addition to that, that's already available, I just wanted to let you know that there's a couple of really exciting new products coming from the thematic group, the early thematic group. The first one is the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology. So the, our lead, David Keith, um, has been leading over the, few, uh, the last few years, a uh, group, uh, a very large group of collaborators from around the world in the designing these, um, proposing this new global typology of ecosystems. It's uh, that might inform, might, that will guide the uh, global assessment of the world ecosystems conducted by the thematic group, but will also help inform, you know, the, the national, the regional, national, and um, national um, uh, assessments, hopefully, uh, through it's it's a hierarchical system with six different uh, levels. At this point, it's only defined uh, until for until level uh, three, so the level of ecosystem functional groups. So it's the broad um, ecosystem units of the world. It's being worked out at level four, which is the one at at which the global assessment will be conducted. And then the idea is for national and subnational um, typologies to be able to fit, which, which are the ones that would go in on, the, on those uh, levels five and six, um, those uh, would fit within that uh, broader, um, those broader levels, and then it will help us understand each other better, better and uh, make those linkages between the units that we're looking at, at these different scales. Um, there's a the first version is already available on the website. It's, it's been, um, it, there was a consultation process. We received a lot of comments, and so there's been some ch changes made, uh, but it will be um, sent out for publication fairly soon. Um, and there, there will be a website, uh, a link to this typology, where you will be able to go into detail of, you know, all of, the, of, all of these uh, different uh, units at the, at the top levels with descriptions of, of what, what each of them means, um, and they are, you know, uh, the biomes and then the uh, ecos ecosystem, the ecological functional groups. Um, each will have their descriptive sheet. And this, the other thing is that we've been working on a database to compile all of these case studies that have already been completed. Uh, we want to summarize them into or make them make them publicly available through an online platform. Um, it's been uh, quite a challenge, but we fin finally have the structure set in place, and we are currently working on uh, populating it. It's a it's a <laughs> time-consuming process since you know we have to extract information from already published papers that might not follow the most um, friendly um, structure for inputting into the database. But you will be able to find there all of the, eventually, it will take some time, but all of the strategic and systematic case studies that follow the, our, the IUCN protocol. Um, and for each of them, you will have a summary of the, uh, of the assessment of what the characteristic of the units, 
um, what and what the results, which criteria were assessed using which indicators and what the results were. And that also will happen for systematic assessments, hopefully. So that's, um, we'll, we are working on that, that, populating it, and we are trying our best to uh, make it publicly available as soon as possible. And lastly, um, if you are interested in learning more in, uh, in, in more than just one hour about the RLE, there's a new uh, open online, o online open course um, the, from the Future Learn platform. Um, it's an introductory course on the RLE. It's free. It takes about two weeks to complete, um, more or less than that if you, you know, work harder each day. Uh, but it's, it's fun for about two weeks of just taking it easy and going through the material. Um, it just, it's just finishing this first uh, round uh, this week. Uh, so we're going to close it. Uh, it's led by uh, the co-lead of the thematic group, Emily Nicholson from Australia, Deakin University. And um, it will, she's just going to go over some revisions and it will reopen on October 1st. And the good news is that will, it will stay open constantly, at least until next year. So for most of the 2021, it will be just available. Um, the language of the course is English, but one of the changes that will happen is that we'll be adding the Spanish, French, and Chinese transcripts of the information um, just to uh, be able to reach more people. So that's coming uh, on October. It's already available, it was already available, but um, it will become available again on October. And just the, you know, the next steps for the group, uh, what we are looking forward to is to expand the coverage of early assessments at the global and national uh, assessment, uh, at the national, at the global level, sorry. Uh, it's already underway under David's uh, lead uh, from Australia, uh, but we'll continue to support as you know as we are uh, resources allow it uh, national and subnational assessments, which are key for uh, uh, which is the level at which policy and decision making are happening. Um, and then uh, we are, we want to uh, focus more on uh, that aspect of reducing risks to ecosystems through policy, so uh, and planning and management. So uh, working, moving beyond the science, which was a part, a large part of that first stage of development, and really looking at the applications and communication of these applications and results. And that's it. I know I covered a lot, but hopefully it will it was useful. Irene, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you're thematic doing. It's you know, the RLE assessment in and of itself is impressive, but all the tools you've developed and guidance documents, et cetera, is really amazing. Thanks for sharing that with us. We have had a really active uh, input into the Q&A. And I've tried to organize those of you who are adding questions towards the end, I'll scroll and try to integrate them um, into the questions I have going. In addition, I did post in the chat a link to where you can find all videos in the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Groups webinar series. Previous videos and upcoming videos, you can access them from the CEM website. I put that link. You can also access them directly from YouTube and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel to get notified as the videos are being posted. Uh, I also wanna put a plug in for our session next month, which is gonna be on nature-based solutions. And we have Emmanuel Kom Shakam, who has been the lead within IUCN CEM in developing ideas about uh, nature-based solutions from the beginning through the assessment of the principles and to her amazing contributions to the global standard. Um, so please join us next month for that. You'll be receiving email information. Okay, Irene, are you ready for my <laughs> grouping of the questions? I'll tell you the categories first. There was a kind of okay. a set of active questions about relationships to other frameworks. And then there were a bunch of questions about how to get training and how to use it. And then there were some technical questions. 
So I'll start with the relationships to other frameworks. And rather than reading the questions, I'll say people mentioned IUCN's green list um, that certifies protected and conserved areas. Um, the, of course, the red list of threatened species. So the questions about the, red, the species list is why do we need a separate red list for ecosystems? Um, questions about whether they're complementary. Um, and then there was a question about how to use it with the nature-based solution standard. So I'll stop there, but in general, people are wondering <laughs> the novel piece and then how to apply it with these other IUCN tools. Yes, um, so uh, just in general, yes, the, the goal is definitely for uh, all of the different uh, protocols and, and, uh, and knowledge products from IUCN to be complementary to each other and to uh, eventually you know, provide a, a, a general view of the world's uh, biodiversity status and really inform uh, in, the, in the best way possible uh, decision making. Um, so it was developed, yes, the Red List of Ecosystems was developed purposely to be complementary to the Red List of Threatened Species. Uh, why we, did we think that we needed an, a separate uh, protocol? Uh, well, in, for one part, um, it's, you know, it's looking at a different level of organization. The Red List of Threatened Species is looking at particular species for their assessments. They're not, it's not looking at, the, and that's important in, our, in itself, uh, but it's not looking at the interactions between these species. That is also a key component of, you know, ecological processes and uh, the environment. Um, and then uh, there's also a pragmatic point, uh, aspect of this that uh, it's, even though it's a lot of work, it's uh, more, uh, it's easier to assess, uh, make assessments at the ecosystem level in terms of when you would complete the entire world, you know, the, all of the world's ecosystems, as opposed to as when we'll complete the uh, red list of threatened species for, for all of the species of the world. So it's, there's just also a pragmatic aspect of providing a more general view of what's happening uh, to that uh, biodiversity at that uh, level. Uh, but it's definitely, um, it's the, we, 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 we dream of a platform that where we'll have the information we'll be able to look at simultaneously the information from the red list of threatened species and the red list of ecosystems and the uh, world database on protected areas and uh, key biodiversity areas. And just, uh, you know, just do um, instant or especially explicit analysis of how all of these interact and uh, just really focus on key areas for um, prioritizing or, or resources and, 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 and management. Um, that might still take some while, but uh, it's in everyone's mind. Um, and similar to, you know, and that also applies, it, it should inform the red list of ecosystems, should inform um, the uh, key, um, key BAs. Um, it's part of it. Uh, it's part of the criteria if you actually look at it. Um, they do consider uh, ecosystem status in there. And um, the, it should also inform the grand list green list as well, right? Because uh, if you're able to monitor these ecosystems through time, it's not only going to point out which ecosystems are not doing well, it should also highlight uh, ecosystems that are doing well, that are, you know, that are not threatened uh, and, and that's not changing through time or that they're not facing severe threats. Um, or even though they might be facing severe threats, something it's been done to reduce their impacts. So uh, it should definitely inform those knowledge products as well. Great, thank you. Is that you. covered all? Yes, um, thank you. The um, next question about relationship to other frameworks, which is super important for our thematic group, is how the assessment is being used to choose areas for restoration. So you mentioned the Columbia assessment um, the Linda Spencer is the person who raised the question. I'll just read her question. How is the assessment being used to choose areas for restoration? The examples of RLE champions users are helpful to me. The RLE is not the only data needed to do conservation restoration work. It mm -hmm. might be used along with social and economic indicators and, and she goes on from there. Uh, yes, for sure. And uh, you know, one of the key slides for the training uh, 
of what for the general introduction of the of the RLE is actually a slide that shows that is a list of different social environmental aspects and cultural aspects that are, are actually part of the of the conservation decision making and priority setting and uh, risk assessments, be it uh, species for species or ecosystems, it's just one of them. Um, so in that sense, uh, the way it's being used, we are proposed to use it, is just as one of the many inputs that need to be taken into account for these uh, priority settings. Um, it's, you know, we consider it's, it's an important one, we think it's a key one that's telling us something really valuable about the state of these uh, ecosystems, but certainly there's other aspects, such as, as some of the, you mentioned already, there's eco economic aspects, uh, cultural aspects, uh, feasibility, just, uh, you know, just uh, the um, viability of applying um, uh, restoration efforts that need to be taken into account. So in the case of, Col of the Colombia case, I feel that it should be Cara saying this because she was a co-author, uh, but um, it was, you know, the, the, the way they did it just briefly was they, um, they had produced the National uh, Red List of Ecosystems of Colombia, so that was um, previous work, but they also had information on where the agricultural areas uh, were located throughout the country and they, and um, where the, the and they had information on, I, I think if I'm remembering correctly, they, con they conducted um, a, a multi-part analysis where um, just the early was part of it, but so they focused on, on, on the areas that were um, grazing, had, uh, what was, uh, was locating, low productivity grazing um, was located uh, where uh, oh, that coincided with areas of uh, highly threatened ecosystems, so critically and endangered, critically endangered and endangered ecosystems, um, and that were low productivity areas, so that they might, you know, uh, it might they might be less costly. That um, they that had low soil productivity. Um, so they looked at different factors that putting, you know, that putting them together. Uh, help them propose areas of forest restoration that might be just less uh, costly um, in terms of you know, impeding uh, economic activities, um, but also just, uh, oh, they, um, just more successful, so that had the higher, highest uh, probability of success because they were located to um, close to uh, you know, rivers or you know, water sources and prop propagules sources. Uh, so it's a combination of factors for sure. There's not that many example, examples that are, um, that's one of the good ones. Um, there's, there's from South, South Africa, I'm sure there's, there's more, uh, but it's just, you know, we're at that stage of where we are trying this uh, out. Um, we, the, the thematic group itself, it's not doing this. So um, it's, we are focusing on those, uh, that first level of doing the assessment but we're definitely engaging more and more collaborators that can take uh, these to the next level. Um, so I'm hoping some of those, some of you participating today are going to be one of some of those people that are, will be applying this or other, uh, not only restoration, but other policies and, and things that, and know, applications that in the future. It's a great segue into the next category of questions were really about how to get information and how to engage and how to use it. So there were several different people asked about how they could access the assessments from you know, Asia or other areas of the globe. Are those all on the RLE website? Um, most of them are. So the, the, the tricky part of uh, growing the RLE has been that we are a very tight group of collaborators, but we are still relatively few people working, you know, uh, each day on this. Uh, there's, I mean, the, 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 the team of collaborators is hundreds of people, especially now with the typology, there's a lot of people involved, but in our day-to-day -day basis, it's still a fairly uh, small group of people. Uh, working on this. So uh, that's, you know, it, it just, what we can do, it's limited to the time that we have and the resources that we have. Um, there are several ways to get engaged. Um, the, the most of the, the website is currently our, one of our best resources, just because there's all of the, the assessments that have been published as um, 
Uh, journal articles are available there. If you know, if they might not be available as PDFs, if they are, you know, uh, they're closed, uh, eight for um, articles. Mm -hmm. But then the links are certainly there. Um, there's, you know, we can you can contact the authors uh, if you need the the, the the paper and can't access it um, any other way. There's thankfully that's gotten a, a lot a lot easier these days. Um, there's um, the database will be available. Uh, Hopefully, you know, if this year, uh, with how, which, with any information that we've been able to transcribe by then, um, there's I, I'm in that slide. I'm not I'm not sure if you can still see it, but there's my email contact. There's also the general early uh, the the email that goes through the the contact email that is early slash contact um, at iucn.org. Um, there's um, there's we have a forum uh, at Google forum of um, assessors, the assessors, there's the link there. It's a very technical group. Um, it's, uh, it's aimed mostly towards people that are already conducting assessments or that will start assessments fairly soon. Uh, and it just, you know, going through the, allows us to go um, collaboratively through any technical questions and difficulties. Um, but the best way, you know, if, if you're interested uh, is to contact um, use either of these contacts or through the contact uh, link on the website and let us know uh, if you're interested in conducting assessment. In terms of training, the, there's a lot of materials already available. Um, there's the guidelines, as I mentioned. There's also some, uh, we are going to be updating the presentation, the training materials that we regularly use for training assessors on the website. The, the, one, the ones that are there are a little, a little out of date. Um, now, but um, that it, it, we don't have resources for a, a, a training program, a stable training program at, at this point. Uh, the training that we've done so far, it's uh, based on specific projects and funding from those projects. Um, so that's what we've done, you know, we work with, uh, we're working right now with Abu Dhabi with, for the red list of the of ecosystems. We've done it in Madagascar and, and in China and uh, a bunch of uh, my, Myanmar. So a bunch of different countries, the thematic group has actually been involved. A couple of people from the thematic group are, have been involved in training uh, the assessors and providing technical support. It, but it's a, it's a pro project um, wise, um, or uh, it's very based on those specific funds. Uh, moving from that, that's why we created, uh, Emily worked so hard on getting that uh, MOOC available, that open online course, which is a, an introductory course. And uh, it's part of our goals to keep those open, uh, you know, online uh, materials available. Um, as, and we are going to be sharing them as we continue to develop, develop them. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, and um, I think you answered everyone's questions here. How can someone find a group in their country? I think that's just email the REL, RLE group, and I put that email in there. And I, I'm talking quickly because I want to get to some of these great technical questions. And there was a whole okay. bunch about um, one specific issue. Um, are the indicators different for each assessment or ecosystem? How does that affect comparability? Um, is the red list categories measuring criteria? Uh, do they vary from region country to region country? If not, why? Um, so there's that about if the indicators are all the same. And then there's another part, which is about whether there are any standardization methods being to develop to facilitate data comparability. And then a question about whether this was developed as a self-assessment tool or if there's a verification process. And like challenges about reporting on targets like the UN uh, Convention on Biological Diversity target. So it's kind of a three part question all about standards, whether the process is the same, what's being done for comparing across regions, if anything, and then about verification. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, so in terms question, of the right? actual protocol, <laughs> yeah, they are great <laughs> questions, and I'm, I'm tr I'll try to do them justice. Um, 
David Keith will do them better justice. <laughs> so now, in terms of the protocol, yes, the, the, the actual protocol, the thresholds do not vary. Uh, so that's what makes them comparable, is that the actual criteria and the criteria and the threshold use do not vary uh, by uh, location or uh, by scale. So we are, that's a difference from the red list of threatened species, is that we don't have specific standards for um, sub-global or re regional assessments that are different than for, our, for global assist, assessments, sorry. Um, so that's one, one point. Um, but the other is that in terms of the indicators, yes, they vary. They vary, uh, the indicators for the spatial uh, criteria are the same, the thresholds are the same, and we work with similar spatial measures. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, A is looking into change of distribution, so it's, we, we look at different, um, a change of extent, uh, through time, the time frames that we use, the, the time windows that we look at for ecosystems are, um, are set and they tend to be 50 year windows looking into the past, uh, the present that looks, you know, a little into the past and some of the future and then just the future. So those, those are set, those time frames and those thresholds. Um, what it varies, especially for, it's for the functional criteria. The, with the type of indicators that we use are absolutely uh, related to what, how that ecosystem functions and what are the key processes that they, you know, that are part of it. So for wetlands, um, I'm guessing that the key indicators are going to be something related to water. And, you know, for, you know, for marine ecosystems, uh, the indicators are going to be very different for, uh, than for uh, terrestrial ecosystems. So it is very, uh, it is, uh, based on the specific unit that you're looking at, of course, there's going to be relationships by types of ecosystems. So there might be, you know, indicators used for tropical forests, no matter where you are in the world, uh, are probably going to be uh, similar. And some, one, something that we're doing, uh, and it, it is part of that, in identifying the, the indicators and finding data for them. Um, but also just setting the, the collapse threshold I think are some of the, the, the harder part of the, of the ecosystem assessment and why you really need a deep understanding of, your, uh, of the ecosystem that you're looking at. Um, but it's getting, it's getting easier in the sense that, uh, you know, there's a lot of work already done. Uh, you don't have to start thinking about this from scratch. There's a bunch of case study examples already available. Um, there's, uh, the guidelines actually include some suggestions on the, of the type of variables that you, are indicators that you might use for each of the criteria, the functional criteria. And uh, as part of the development for the global typology, actually one of the components that David, David and the team are working on is um, in constructing these uh, generalized conceptual models that, you know, they're looking at that higher level uh, units but they, um, the key processes are going to be this relevant or, this, or similar to ones that we will expect to look at uh, at the lower levels. So that those might also uh, guide the process for new assessors. Um, so you're every, uh, everyone that starts with this right now, it's in a much better position than five years ago for anyone that was uh, conducting an assessment. Um, in terms of the frameworks, it, it was, um, it was the, the early was developed as its own framework within, you know, the IUCN knowledge products. Um, but something that's happening is that um, it's been, especially now with the global typology, it's definitely been taken into consideration by um, other frameworks, particularly for, for informing um, international targets. So David has been very much involved with the, um, uh, CEA, CEA um, group, which I always forget what it stands for, but it's the, the it's natural accounting uh, group. It's very much looking into using the typology now um, for uh, this, their framework, and there's a lot of discussions on uh, helping, you know, informing the SDG, SDGs as well. Um, so um, yeah, it's just being. It wasn't developed specifically for that, um, but it's definitely. Uh, being adopted more and more, and there's more interesting on using it for, it, for those type of things. And I forget what the, there was a third part that I forget, sorry. Sorry, I can't hear you, Kata, you're muted. 
Um, the third part was about standardization or, and if this is a self verification or if there's some kind of verification process. Um, for so use. I'm not sure. Like UN, at, you know, maybe this question doesn't really make sense because it's not warranting actions, but. Okay. But just, but just in case, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the exactly the question, but I, it just gives me a way of uh, a safe way to say that um, the um, so the way that the, the, that we are uh, approaching the revision uh, or uh, you know how, how do we know if an assessment complied with the actual the, the criteria and the protocol. Um, because we are such a limited number of people at this point, we yeah. don't have established, you know, a, a units such as the, our, the species, do, a species does. So uh, at this point, we are very much reliant on the peer review process of mm -hmm. uh, publications. So for many of the case studies that you'll see on the website, uh, they are journal articles and we are relying on the, that peer review process. And, uh, you know, a lot of, mo in most of those uh, for most of those assessments, at least one of the members of the thematic group was involved in the revision process. So we are confident on that. We are trying to establish a more robust and you know, uh, clear uh, editorial process, but um, you know, we have to grow in numbers a little bit more uh, before we can tackle that. Um, the other thing that we're doing is that for specifically, especially for systematic assessments, um, Many, most of them, and uh, not all, but most of them have had someone from, you know, these countries or regions have actually reached out to the thematic group to have us involved from the start to guide, you know, the training and the, and the technical support so that there's all, there's, uh, in most cases, there has been one of us involved in that uh, technical support. So that's, you know, there's part, that part of revision and technical uh, accountability, if you may. Um, of the quality of the assessments. Great, thank you. We're about 20 minutes over time, so I yes. think I'm gonna <laughs> cut the session off here. We still have so many interesting questions. I'll just encourage those of you who do have questions, especially the more technical questions, you may find answers in the documents, especially the guidance document. So I'd encourage you to look there. I will say that I learned about the value of the RLE approach for restoration through my involvement with the Columbia assessment. And what we learned through the setting or assessing restoration priorities using the red list of ecosystems within the assessment. And as Irene mentioned, there were multiple other um, variables that were also considered. But in comparison with the national restoration plan, the assessment that used the RLE showed very, very different priorities. And in fact, the overlap mm -hmm. between the two assessments was very, very minimal. So we can see the added value of taking the ecosystems approach when we're thinking about priorities for restoration. Irene, you didn't get to see the chat, all the um, thank yous and congratulations for an excellent presentation. I'll just add my congratulations and thank you for participating with us in the series. This um, really was a tremendous opportunity for everyone to get a little peek into the RLE and um, to have the opportunity now knowing what's out there to look a little bit deeper. So hopefully we'll see all of you or many of you next month in September when we will be talking about nature-based solutions, some exciting activity within the field of nature-based solutions is the release of the new global standard and um, let's see, do we have this up here? Yes, thank you, Brock. That's next month, September 18th at the same time. And in the meantime, contact me or Brock, Kara Nelson, the, my email was up in the chat and let me know if you have any questions. Bye-bye everybody. Thank, thank you and yeah, reach out if you have any additional questions, I'll do my best to answer them. And thank you for the opportunity, Kara and Brock. <laughs>